you very much for being here this morning. I don't know if you've seen the downstairs room, but it's very tempting to hang out in that downstairs room, which looks absolutely fabulous. So thank you for having made it to the fifth floor. Um, and welcome to the Climate uh, Ampersand, Climate End program that we are creating here at Kite Insight. So I'm Sophie Lambin, I'm the CEO of Kite Insights and curator of what, with my team here, what I hope will be a series of really compelling discussions today. At Kite, we have a, a long history of um, examining the ways in which complex issues intersect and impact society. We believe that it is only by understanding those intersections and how the, the impacts are exacerbated that leaders can really begin to deploy meaningful and lasting solutions. So we have tried to make a virtue of that vision through the program by covering the intersection of climate and gender, climate and system change, the sessions we are about to have, climate and energy, climate and people, we have a riveting debate later today, and cl climate and innovation. Through, we do that through a range of perspectives and themes, including, of course, policy, justice, design thinking, climate science, finance, and women leadership. Now, we're lucky enough to be a long-standing content partner of the New York Times, who are kindly joining us later today at 1 p.m. for a debate in partnership with LinkedIn on whether we can upskill our way out of the climate crisis, which should be very exciting. The New York Times will also host a fireside chat here with Johan Rockström and Tom Friedman at 3.30 today. This program and the thinking behind it is really what Kite does best. And we are really thrilled and proud to share it all with you today. And I'd like to also say that we have uh, today's sessions are filmed and live stream and we have, I'm told, a very large audience online. So, without further ado, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Kirsten Dunlop, who is the CEO of Climate Kick, and I would say a kick-ass pioneer of climate innovation and systemic resilience, who will moderate our first session on climate and system change. So please join me in welcoming Kirsten with her speakers. Thank you very much indeed, Sophie, and welcome everyone this morning. We have two, we have three, two speakers here, and one, I believe, scurrying across the, scop the COP site, hopefully connecting with a buggy to help that process. So we will begin and hope to welcome our third speaker as he arrives. So welcome this morning to Lorna Gold, who is the CEO of Faith Invest, to Tim Brown, who's the chair of IDEO and the vice chair of Q, and we will be joined, hopefully, by Maximo Magdocco, who is on the steering committee of the Youth Climate Justice Fund. And my name is Kirsten Dunlop. Uh, very, very um, happy to be here, and particularly to have this kind of a discussion so critical and so timely for the context of a COP like this, where we are at a moment of significant forking and tipping points that could go in the right or the wrong direction, depending on what we all make happen. So let me just start with a little bit of a framing on this notion of climate and systems change, the idea around what does it mean to apply the language of tipping points, which we know coming from the science is being applied to the notion of planetary transformation and the tipping points that climate and warming greenhouse gas emissions effects are having. How might we apply the same insight, the same understanding to our own behaviors, our own human social systems, our financial systems, and our mindsets? So when we're talking about systems change, we're talking about an effect that is non-linear, in which all of the parts of a system and the relationships between those parts and the rules that govern those relationships and the mindsets that infuse, underpin, and assume underneath them all change in a continuously adaptive way and ideally, for what we need now, in a directional way, taking us towards something that is about deeply placing thriving, sustainable, regenerative, equitable lives and livelihoods at the heart of a world that manages to rebase and reframe its relationship with the natural environment. 
So how might we learn from what we have experienced across any era and decade on the idea of understanding systems change not only as something that we call for, but something that we positively shape, that we unleash as a set of dynamic outcomes? I personally um, love to remind myself of the Cherokee fable that is embedded in, for those of us who watch uh, Hollywood films with George Clooney in them, that is embedded in Tomorrowland around the idea of the two wolves that are constantly fighting within us, the hope and despair, constantly fighting in each of us which one wins, the one you feed. The idea of these positive or negative reinforcing loops of what we believe is what we feed, what we feed is what we get, and it enables or constrains our actions. So we are here with people whose expertise, whose perspectives, whose life experience has been right embedded in that set of inquiries. So I'm going to ask each of you uh, to just reflect on a question in this regard, and perhaps as you reflect, reflect on where you're speaking from. And the question that I want to put to you is, how have you observed, or what do you observe, around tipping points for transformation in human behavior and human social systems, the problem that we have on shifting the design for human life? What are the characteristics of, positing, of positive tipping points in this regard? Let's perhaps start with Tim, if you wouldn't mind. So thank you very much. Uh, so I guess I'm speaking from uh, you know, uh, the viewpoint of the role of creativity. I, uh, in my role at Q, which is, a, which is a creative collective, a collective of different organizations that each bring a different view of design and creativity to the world. Um, so I tend to look at change through, through, through that perspective. And I think what I was going to comment on is sort of three phenomena, if you like, that I've, I've noticed seem to be in place when you get change, this sort of uh, you know, rapid change that is, is the mark of a tipping point um, in, a, in a human system. And this is really important to note that this is a human, these are human systems we're talking about because there are, there are qualities of human systems that do not exist in, in other non-human systems like weather patterns and things like that. Um, so the first of those uh, is a shift from uh, a sort of a res responsibility mindset, if you like, or a rational mindset. We should be changing because it is the right thing to do to a desirability mindset or an emotional mindset. We're shifting because it's what we want to do. It's because the world presents an op option or an opportunity that we actually prefer to the, to the, to the current state. So obviously, my, in my job as a, as a designer, uh, you know, I see that as how can we design product services and systems that are simply better than whatever we had in the old world, that are simply provide better lives, provide better solutions, are more, uh, uh, maybe are, are easier to, uh, to, 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 to live with, uh, you know, are more, are more preferable. And obviously we've seen that in previous eras. I mean, the whole of the Industrial Revolution was built on the idea of making mass products desirable to people. Not got us into the state we're in today, but it actually you know, was very effective. Similarly, in the digital era, with experiences and services, um, here in the climate era, it, 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 uh, we, we need to expand out to the to the design of desirable systems. But we can already start to see evidence um, of of, of of the leap towards um, solutions that are kind of more climate appropriate, uh, that are more desirable. I mean, one one simple example. It's only a simple step, but might, you might think about something like the you know the new Ford F-150 Lightning, the electric truck. It's actually a better truck than the gas-powered version. It serves its users in a more effective way, in a more complete way, and that it serves their whole lives through the kinds of features and products and services it offers in a better way than the gas version ever ever, ever did. It's a, that's a small step. It's a product, but um, it, it's an example. Second phenomena um, that I that I've noticed is that what what I see happening in in any uh, kind of journey of change is right at the beginning when you've only got sort of a few innovators or activists who are who are who are uh, uh, working for change. The language tends to be quite aligned because it's not very many people. But then, as a movement grows or a shift, the, the language often gets highly misaligned. People start inventing new terms for everything, and 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 everything slows down because everybody's confused. Is it 
Is it cradle to cradle or is it circular economy? I mean, what, what, what terms are we actually using to represent the change we want to? And so as the change accelerates, you start to see aligned language appearing again. And so uh, we, we need to be looking out for which language is winning, which narratives are winning that we can, that we can, all, we, we can all align around. Um, and then the third uh, phenomena that we see, uh, that we've seen repeatedly uh, in systems level shifts is around innovation. And that's a shift in innovation from the few to the many. So um, I started my career uh, in, as a designer just as the PC revolution was getting going. And that was, that was a really gr good example of um, what happened when PC started arriving on everybody's desk or in their, you know, in their bedroom, enormous amounts of innovation happened because there were simply more people who were experimenting with this new technology than ever could ha happen when you had mainframes and mini computers in computer labs in universities and corporations. Um, the same thing is happening right now with AI. So with the release of these large language models, suddenly we've got thousands of people innovating with AI, whereas we only had a small number of people innovating before. So you get an explosion of new, of new ideas. So we need those kinds of um, uh, tipping points to happen within the climate space. We need to get innovation out of the hands of the few and into the hands of the many. So that's just three phenomena that I've noticed. So you're describing a kind of a human social system versions of, of phase transitions, like when you kind of pile sand up on a beach and then all of a sudden it suddenly falls and you yeah. can't quite work out when and how it's going to happen, you know, something yeah. about... You almost certainly can't. I mean, nobody predicted 18 months ago that a, a year ago, you know, suddenly the AI thing was going to tip. At what point? It was ridiculous, really, that we couldn't even see that far ahead. Mm. But it is often very unpredictable. So then this, tells, this says, suggests to me there's something about not trying to engineer this and kind of know when we're going to predict it, but prepare the mindsets and capabilities to look for it and work, work with it quickly. Indeed. Yeah. Let me come to you, Lorna. What's your perspective on this question? Um, well, maybe just to start off where, I, where I'm kind of coming from on this, um, from really from a movement building point of view, having worked for over 20 years within the climate movement with a strong kind of emphasis on the whole role of faith communities, um, and we've seen massive changes and in, in the climate movement and a lot of kind of ups and big downs and then unpredictable kind of increases in awareness and shifts within that time. And I guess one of, when, you, when I was asked to, to kind of come onto this panel, I thought about one system change that I, I saw uh, within Ireland where I live, um, which was around the attitudes towards uh, fossil fuels and investments. And um, we, we managed as a campaign to get the government to dive, become the first government in the world to divest its sovereign wealth fund from fossil fuels. That's now five years ago when that happened. And I was thinking, how did that actually kind of happen? Well, I think the first one, I, I agree with you, Tim, it, it, it's always something that seems impossible until it kind of, the famous words of Nelson Mandela, it's impossible until it's done. So it's seen as impossible what you want to achieve. So at right now, us uh, achieving 1.5 degrees um, uh, and through the decisions that this COP will make actually, frankly, seems quite impossible um, because we're like there are so many governments um, pursuing the opposite policies of scaling up fossil fuels. Um, so it seems impossible until it's done. It, so that requires a sense of moral imagination um, to be able to see what needs to be done beyond the, the practicalities. When we advocated for fossil fuel divestment, we were told we, we were like idealists. We were, you know, all those things that you kind of get told when you're, you're, you're engaging in impossible change. Um, so that's so it's about generating that kind of common vision and a sense of moral imagination to achieve the impossible goal. But I think the other thing for me, when change really starts to take off, is when that also becomes embedded within um, key policies, which can seem quite kind of, which is maybe where the COP fits into this, because a small change of a word can have a massive institutional change and can have a massive financial change. Um, so that, so that getting, for example, there's a big dis 
debate at the COP around unabated, the word unabated fossil fuels. And if that comes into the final language, um, frankly, we're in a really, really um, tough position in terms of salvaging um, the, the, the commitment or the, the, re the possibility of reaching 1.5. So it's about having the vision of like impossible change, embedding that within um, the, 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 the policy environment, even if it seems quite small in relative to everything else. And I think the other thing is around, um, and maybe this is part of what you were saying as well about, I call it the lighthouse effect, because people want to see even if it's very small, the work I do now is with faith communities aligning their investments to, to their values, which are not the values of the mainstream asset management community. They've just kind of allowed that to happen. Um, but when they do that, even if it's a really small organisation, like we work with the English Sangha Trust, a Buddhist group in, in the UK, very small amount of investments, but they have demonstrated that it is possible for a faith group to align their investments to the values of Buddhism. Um, that's remarkable. Um, and it has this kind of ripple effect, a snowball kind of effect, the, um, a demonstration effect. It's like proof of concept, I suppose, in terms of um, design. So yeah, I think um, I'd agree with a lot of your com your, what you're saying. So that's absolutely fascinating. I remember when I, I was working insurance at the heart of the financial, what Australia called the financial crisis without actually experiencing it. And uh, that simple shift that the Financial Stability Board introduced of institutions that were too systemically important to fail turned on a dime conversations with boards that until that point had been completely uninterested. And it's an interesting question of could we do the same, you know, value systems, food systems that are too systemically important not to transform? How much can you drive? This notion of kind of embedding, embedding something that is small enough to make its way under the radar and infective enough to drive a whole set of outcomes. I want to come back to, the, to one of the core enabling conditions for that around the notion of imagination and particularly a question around a deficit of imagination. How do we shift from uh, the, the question of thinking about this in rational terms where everything seems impossible because you are adding up how much you have to give up to creating a context where we start to imagine a world in which it is so much more interesting, enjoyable, fun, playful, just to, to thrive and survive. But my question would be, how do we create those kinds of imaginaries? Who shapes them? How do we unleash a way of imagining that stays, kind of steers a course on that knife edge between utopia and dystopia and creates something meaningful, nuanced, local, ownable? Well, maybe I can start by just talking a bit about the work that we're doing with, with faith communities. I mean, I think we can tend to be quite, let's say, Western-centric in our conversations around this. And we forget that 85% of the world's population um, adhere to, to a faith. Um, and that in the past 20, 30 years, there's been a great awakening of faith communities to environmental justice to a revival around what are the common values that all faiths share around the sacred nature of, of the planet, the sacred, sacred earth, we call it. Um, and this is having massive kind of inroads. Um, you would have heard um, perhaps on, on Saturday, Pope Francis, who wasn't here, um, called for the elimination of fossil fuels. You didn't just magic that out of the air. There's a huge kind of movement within the faiths that have been asking him to, to take that cause forward um, and to, to be bold um, in terms of what is actually being called for. But that work of faiths, uh, faith communities, is happening right across the world, across all faith traditions. Um, the, the Islamic world has a, a comparable movement uh, called Al Mizan, the balance, uh, which is a, there's a lot of conversation around it here in, in at COP. And for the first time here at COP, we have a, a faith, multi-faith space called the Faith Pavilion, very well worth um, 
going to. It's in the blue zone if you have a blue zone uh, ticket. And that's, that's just a fulcrum of imagination. In fact, I'd say before this session, I was, I was at two press conferences. One was the Climate Action Tracker Report. Very high powered, very data driven, very important because it tells us we're not on the right path, but no solutions. I then sat, was on a panel with the Brahma Kamaris movement, who have millions of followers throughout the world, where it was about just energy transition, demonstrating what they're actually doing to reach tens of thousands of people through clean energy, and um, supporting yogic farming. Um, really amazing concepts. The, the, the um, press conference was empty, unfortunately, because Everybody's interested in the data. Nobody is interested in yogic farming. And the, yeah, because it makes us smile. They should be. They make, yeah, they should be because it was so beautiful about consciousness change and the need to care for each other. And yeah, we need a bit more of that, I think. Couldn't agree more. I, mean, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that communities of different scales and in different contexts are going to be where a lot of the imagination comes uh, and a lot of the solutions come. I mean, uh, but I think there are two challenges to ha for for that community-based approach having the full impact that it might. Um, one is, um, and, and and maybe uh, I, uh, it has been cracked in the faith communities and not anywhere else. But um, but we we're not all that clear on how to scale community-based solutions, particularly if the solutions themselves are local. Technologies, but that's not how the scaling of community-based solutions work. It's about replication. It's much more of a kind of a biological, or I think you talked about the idea of rhizomes when we were talking before, um, Kirsten. It, it, it's this, this biological replication. And we, and we don't yet have all of the mechanisms for encouraging that to happen faster. Than, um, uh, and so that, that's work to be done, in my opinion. The second, the second thing is that, uh, that sitting below that community, the power of communities, is uh, the mindsets of individuals. And... Uh, one of the things that we've observed, and, uh, and one of the one of my sort of one of our cousin organisations within Q is publishing some um, research work, so BE Works, which is a behavioural um, science team, pu publishing some work this week on creative mindsets um, and 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 what having a creative mindset does to prepare us individually and collectively for dealing with a climate crisis. And it turns out um, those of us, those people that do have a creative mindset, and that might come from a workplace environment, it might come from some other environment, are more optimistic, are more future oriented, and are more resilient, um, and uh, more open minded. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it, it, it seems to me that there's work to do to encourage more of us as individuals to feel confident um, in our own creative mindsets, our own creative capabilities at whatever level, in whatever, in whatever, in whatever way, because that will power communities so much more effectively, I think. Well, in fact, that was one of my reflections on this whole question around positive tipping points is... Oops. The race we are in is a race against despair. And once we start to shut down our ability to connect with the idea that the impossible is possible, we are restricting our capacity to act. So what can we do? How do we create space? Creative mindsets, then we need to completely unengineer and reverse what we've done in the last 500 years to separate art and science and separate creativity and engineering to create that space for generative response to crisis that gives us the powering up possibilities. Mm. What do you see as, what would we, or what might we build immediately to prepare ourselves to make the most of every single moment of crisis, of chaos, of uncertainty, of confusion, of fear, and a sense of loss? Well, for me, it all comes back to the idea of community and connection, mm -hmm. rebuilding connection. And I mean, I've, I think, that 
I mean, there, there's a real problem at the moment. Like we're working against ourselves in terms of getting people's attention and keeping people's attention on the crisis that we're in because everything wants to distract us from the actual roots of the crisis and the, the reality. And there's a fear that, as you say, if we are straight about where we are, like people close off because it's blooming scary like where things are and we need to be able to say that. I think that communities, whether they're faith communities, multi-faith or any faith community that can bring us into the tolling of the bell around the so an, a ritual of grief for this the way the world has become and we can't deny that sense of grief because otherwise it becomes a little bit like some of what's going on here it's a bit of a facade it's a bit of a kind of it feels very shallow some of it in terms of the the kind of existential sense of God, we've really made a, I won't swear, but we've made a right mess of the situation. We need to change direction. That sense of coming together, opening that space where people can express in whatever way they feel their emotion, it really, d it talks to the deepest self and it awakens something really committed around um, the need to change and to act. And if you can connect that into a sense of community, it lessens the sense of self-isolation because that's where despair comes, especially amongst, um, well, not just amongst young people, all ages, I've got many friends who are despairing now. Um, but it, it, you can get move from despair or move from grief, which is not despair. Grief is a, an, a human emotion that we all experience. It's about understanding that where we are isn't where we want to be but you can move into action if there's a sense of community. Um, and I, I mean, I've seen many, I could talk a long time about that, the examples of where that works. So there's an, uh, a real sense of how do we design for humans yep. and cathartically let go, yes. ritually let go of cars as a means of personal transport, of the notion of, uh, so let's come actually, if while I say that aloud to myself, let's come to some of the hardest edges that we would need to get to. The Club of Rome came out late last year with the Earth for All report, spotlighting the fact that if there is one thing we need to solve for as the root cause of all, it's poverty and inequality. Mm -hmm. We cannot solve for climate if we are not willing to address structurally power shifts and the distribution of well-being across this planet. So how might we, coming back to a systems frame, think about positive tipping points that are emotional, social, ritual, cathartic, to let go of privilege in ways that genuinely reacquaint ourselves or unleash a kind of mobilization of effect? How might the creative mind help us do that? Well, I mean, part of, part of the privilege that we're dealing with is that there are concentrations of creative capacity and investment in creativity mm. that are inequitable, right? And so uh, one thing we can do about it is to, is, is to solve for that, which is whether that's through education, whether, whether that's through the way that resources are de deployed, whether it's by listening harder and, and observing harder in parts of the world where we don't listen very hard and we haven't observed very carefully to see examples that should be elevated and, and made as beacons. Uh, that the Demonstration should, effect. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, uh, but I think listening harder is one of the things that we that that, that, that we that we, we we can do. I was I was um, fortunate enough to be working with some of the Earthshot Prize winners last year, and um, one of the teams that I really love working with was, was the women of the Great Barrier Reef, who are a wonderful community of indigenous leaders, indigenous women, who are kind of basically figuring out how to get the community to clean up one of the world's most beautiful and important natural resources, and. Um, uh, just listening to them, I learned so much about uh, about how, what they were learning about about uh, about in, in engaging and their, their their community and 
Uh, and, uh, you know, they were super confident that they could replicate that idea or others could replicate that idea. So let's let's start listening harder and, and, and maybe that'll help balance some of these inequities. And then that depends very much on what how we listen. Are we listening to fix? Are we listening to solve? Are we listening to learn, genuinely learn? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't believe you can listen to solve unless you're listening to learn. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, maybe, I, I, you know, it's a very, very... Good question. If we had the answers to that, we would be <laughs> very, very much in a better place. I think, to me, there's two two sides of it. I think that we really need, especially at this COP and leaving this, to face face into um, the vested interests, um, in particular in relation to fossil fuels, that are. If we do not tackle that, things will just keep getting worse and worse. So looking at where there's potential tipping points in relation to that, and I would say, for example, the, the movement that's building around the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty has all the characteristics of s treaties that happened in the past that were game changers, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. So, that, so I was at an event um, organized by that group um, on, on Saturday, um, where Colombia became the first oil producing country to sign up to this treaty. That's a tipping point. I could feel it in the room. You know, you could feel that I get shivers when I think about it, that it was electric. Um, it felt like the unstoppable arc of history starting to shift because here's a state that has to face the, the country, like its people, with a very difficult challenge, um, but is prepared to, to be the lighthouse. Now there's 11 countries. And I think, so I think that we do need to face these difficult issues and we need real political leadership around that. I'm, I find it very hard to see where we're going to get that political leadership, frankly. That's a big challenge at that level. Well, I, I was on a, a discussion yesterday, a fabulous discussion yesterday, where one of the real challenges back was, let's stop telling simple stories about global north versus global yeah. south. Climate will be mitigated by collectives in the global south, Perfect. probably yeah. women-led. So for God's sake, let's power them up and learn as quickly as possible. And I think, but one of the interesting things that came out was this question of stamina. How do you put the stamina behind those tipping points so that they... Exactly. I was actually a question I want to ask both of you. There was a report that came out in Davos this year uh, on, on the breakthrough effect, on positive tipping points in terms of unintended consequences, positive, of policy, regulation, investment, actually creating a flow through, like positive tipping point cascades. Mm. Because things are interdependent, we haven't thought about that, we haven't designed for that. So how do we create something that has the stamina to unleash movements that are no longer uh, containable in the sense mm. of, of one leading to another? I mean, all systems change is rel relies on feedback loops, positive mm. feedback loops, right? So. So it's where the it's where we have to balance this, if you like, the the hardness and and struggle and despair with the breakthroughs and the successes yeah. and the optimism. Exactly. Because if we only focus on despair, then you get negative feedback loops, yeah. um, you, and, and and we don't get change that way, right? Sure. Um, whether it's change we want or not, they come from it comes from positive feedback loops. Mm -hmm. And you know we, we can see so many examples of where positive feedback loops have led to paying people paying more attention to opportunities to innovate or change or think differently. And whether that's in technology, where uh, where positive feedback loops I think are, are beginning to really accelerate. I mean, you know, it wasn't that long ago when when everybody was was saying there is going to be no innovation in battery storage any time that we can, we can see coming up coming up. That was not. That was less than ten years ago, and we've seen enormous breakthroughs in mm. in that. So suddenly, we have technologies available that might make it possible for us mm. to move away from from from, from fossil fuels, yeah. um, and that's just one example of many. And so, um, uh, but I think what, what I think what we need to be looking for more of, and we have we don't have an example of, is, are those positive feedback loops and change with regard to human with people's behaviour, yeah. mm. right? I mean, technology is easy to point at in some ways. But where we're seeing positive change in behavior, we're not celebrating enough. And, uh, uh, and I, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I'd like to, I'd, I'd love us to see more, see more of that. Thank you both very much. Now, we have uh, 
I think about three minutes for a question, comment from the audience before we wrap up. I would love to see someone put up. Okay, two people, both of you first. I work in finance and I'm wondering, is it imagination that we need to break this dichotomy between care and self-interest or actually do we just need regulation? Okay, let's hold that. And you had a question here? Hi, how are you? Sorry, I, I had to be part of the panel, but I was I was late. Uh, no, no, don't worry, don't worry. Um, cr crazy life, cop life, no? Uh, what? We have only two minutes. Sorry, sorry. All right, so uh, hang in a minute. No, eh? no, let's change the. So let's change the form. you answer that question, and add a thing. I, I was going to make a comment on youth. Uh, so sorry, but uh, I. How was the question? Sorry. an industry that thrives on possibility, but I think it's in some ways either being told what to do, so maybe it's policy and regulation that will actually have the seismic shift. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'm answering my own question, but I'd love reflection. Uh, for me, it's a sandwich of both. Well, I am from the Youth Climate Justice Fund. We are trying to redefine what financing uh, means, and I work in, in another, other, where I have different hats with finance and environment and impact. Um, I was going to say something right now that maybe is with both. We, uh, I'm from Argentina. We have a new president that he's more or less a Donald Trump paradigm, no, Bolsonaro. Uh, he doesn't believe in climate change. Um, he won uh, with almost zero budget of advertising, the first time in history in the continent. He used social media uh, as the main channel. Uh, millions and millions of rich, well, he won. He won using social media. And youth, youth. Youth that bought the idea, not about climate change, but because we have 50% poverty, it's like you, you, you keep some ideas there and it's like fire. So what I, what I want to say with this is, look, this guy went to presidency with almost zero budgets of advertising, no? Uh, now he comes or any of us could be uh, that guy, he demonstrated because he didn't come with a political background. Eh? He was a teacher in the university four years ago. He started his political career two years ago, and now he's president of a G20 country. So let's imagine the possibilities out there that we all have. Um, here, it's a sandwich. We need regulations. We need to get it into, into policy making, of course. Uh, I, I'm empowering a lot of youth to do that because uh, as youth, we had a, a, a grow exponentially in all the uh, climate and ecological crisis, all sectors. But when is the moment that we are going to say we need to be in the inside, not only in the outside? When we are going to be making the decisions? So now we are encouraging people from all around the world, youth, to say, hey, go into politics. Before we were more like, let's go in the outside civil society or, or private sector or this and that. Now we are encouraging, yes. We need a lot of new political parties, new way of doing politics, and, not, and I'm not afraid of saying this. Maybe it's because I come from Latin America, and it's very, very common no, to have political parties. I don't know how it's in the rest of the world. But I encourage youth to get into, into politics and try. Try to tell people how to do things better and not to punish, but in the other way. No? And we, we can be really creative. And from the other way, financing, yes, there's a lot of uh, talking about finances, but it's not going to the right people always. It's not inclusive, it's not with equity, it's not with diversity, it's not with uh, all the good, uh, with justice. Uh, for example, we launch an application no? in the uh, Youth Climate Justice Fund. In a couple of weeks, without promoting a lot in social media, 2,000 applications. People that need are asking for 5K, 10K, 15K, small grants. People that need that, like a, as, a, as initial push, no? And you say, hey, it's not about giving always a million dollars or $5,000. Maybe when, with small grants, you can, you can do a revolution because you give the, the, the strength or, or an initial motivation not motivation, sorry, uh, initial resource, so they can start rolling. Uh, but well, I'm speaking too fast because I know that we have. So we have actually 
an example of a magical time bending where we just had a whole lot more time given to us. So let's use that time budget. <laughs> Lorna, uh, you, we started this panel talking about you were reflecting on the, the Irish Southern Wealth Fund divesting from oil and gas. Was that an emotional decision? What was a question of imagination? Was it a question of regulation? I doubt the regulation was in place. So, No, it, I mean, it, there, it was the regulation. There was a precedent for it because they had divested from landmines. Um, so this was seen as we used that legislation. So I think there is, there's work to be done on so many levels. I think that's the challenge of this conversation is it's so many different mm. levels. You need to, so let's say the system change happens when there is collaboration across. So we worked with uh, a legal team, the Client Earth legal team. We worked with campaigners. We worked with these young people in the universities. We worked with the Bishop's Conference. So there was, and there was a, a joint approach to change um, because we couldn't, I mean, there wasn't any point in us just with placards calling for change on the outside. We actually, we built a coalition across the political parties. So we worked within the political system to, and we, we saw a political moment. We actually nearly brought down the Irish government at one point, which was like, because there was a, there was a minority government. So we knew that if, uh, enough members of parliament voted for this it it was like it would go through because otherwise um, there would it would destabilize um, so th I think that question of collaboration but your point around financing and funding I mean there's the investment paradigm that needs to shift and I think that the big institutions have a big institutional uh, investors have a big role to play there in in terms of their own policies, being much clearer on what they need and what they want. That's market. The market will shift. But then there's this question around philanthropy. Um, we had a really good session last week on faith, uh, science and philanthropy ahead of COP28 because um, there's, there's not enough philanthropy going to the, the, the scale of the solutions and the, it's venture philanthropy that's needed. It's those really small, a bit like the, I mean, the, the, the what do you call it, Prin, uh, Prince William's fund is a, a whole other level, but like you need those really, you need to invest in, well, let's say it's, it's a game of, game of chance as well, because out of those thousand small projects, one might, be amazing and go to scale. But anyway, yeah. I mean, so that's let always me, how venture investing Yeah, works. exactly. Yeah. Well, and I want to ask about this because I would describe this as, and in fact, one of the things I uh, learned about when I was working, uh, drawing on IDEO's experience was this notion of learning from the edges yes. and how you really make that happen. But I watch a world in which that is easily tokenizable, whether it's indigenous voices, youth voices, the kind of you, you bring someone on stage with a hat on and all of a sudden we're back in reinforcing, underpinning existing assumptions. So how do we really scale up, out, down, learning from the edges so that we unleash some of these collective forces? I mean, yeah, you got to, you've, got to, you've got to decide why you're, why you're trying to learn from, from the edge. Are you trying to learn from the edge just because you want to feel good, or are you trying to learn from the edge because you actually want to expand the creative space available for solutions, right? And that's, that's why I w want to learn from the edge. I want to. I want to understand mindsets, understand perspectives that I have not understood before in order to expand the possibility space. Um, and, and if you're doing it for that reason, then it, it is sort of automatically leveling, right? <laughs> because suddenly, in fact, it's the opposite, uh, it, it, because it tends to suck power and attention away from the... From the about that question about regulation and imagination is it's clear you need both, but it's a very particular kind of regulation that fires the imagination. There's a form of regulation that kills imagination, and that's overly specified regulation. You will do this, and then you will do this, and then that will happen. That kind of regulation um, kills innovation, but the kind of regulation which resets the playing field, which changes the constraint in an interesting way, can open up a new, all new kinds of possibilities. One good example of that, 
ocean conservation zones, right? That's a form of regulation, which is simply, we're just gonna draw a line in the ocean, and we're gonna say behavior is different inside of this space, and when, it's, when that happens, you look at all of the imagination that gets applied to, okay, we're gonna think about the fishing industry differently, we're gonna think about the tourist industry differently, we're gonna think about economies differently. All kinds of imagination is possible because of a kind of regulation which simply resets constraints or changes constraints. It doesn't tell people what they must then do. So that notion of enabling constraints, please do. Um, can I ask you a thing as part of that? How might that apply to unleashing the youth movement with motions that are less about anger and more about makership? Yeah, totally. That's b very important. Uh, I, um, I was co-author of three national laws about the environment in my country. So about regulation, no? Till now, uh, no, no, no one of those laws are implementing. Why? Because there are priorities. So you can have a lot of things written, and depending on where you are, uh, law regulations are applied or not. You can have a million regulations, but if people just understand them, we are not educated, and we do not embrace them with the why, the how, understand them, it, they will never be fulfilled. Uh, just a comment, no? Because I'm all, all day struggling with this. Um, then 0 0.7 approx of all the philanthropy that goes to climate, goes to youth, only 0 0.7. That's a study that we did and we launched last year. Uh, so let's imagine the possibilities. We are all day here in the panel talking about youth no, and the ages and, and the marginalized groups, etc. But actually, how many resources are we given to these groups? That's, that's an, uh, only with that you understand. And let's, let's say something for me that is, is clear. Why uh, the cops now have 70K people? Last year, 30K. 10 years ago, I was doing this, there weren't 30K people at COPS. No? There are different reasons. Consequences, communication tools, etc. But the number one for me is the youth involvement. That started like huge in 2018, uh, 2019, it continued growing, and that's one of the main reasons why the agenda grows so much. The new generations are demanding this, and if we know the uh, supply chain, how it works uh, in Spanish, offer and demand, like that, okay, well, you will do what the, 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 the demand is asking. So what I mean with this is, if youth has such an important role, why we are only giving 0.7% when we know all the possibilities, they do amazing things with so little, with so little, so many projects I know that started with almost nothing and now are huge or, or influence so many people. And maybe I can... Somebody doesn't like religion, so we can't fund you. It's, it's really, and these are, again, faith communities working at the very grassroots, upscaling tens of thousands of climate projects um, on very little budget, because like the youth, they see it as part of their inner, or their mission, like, like the old fashioned missionary work, but now that's more like this mission for climate care. Um, doesn't cost a lot. Um. Doesn't matter. Unfortunately, we are going to have yeah. to close. This is, this is the kind of conversation I would really love to keep going for a while because this is where hope comes from. We've talked about emotions. We've talked about actually un acknowledging and unleashing the power of our imagination to make possible what we rationally believe is impossible. We've talked about language, finding and shaping a common language enough to power up and connect... We've talked about power shifts in listening, deeply listening, listening with action and energy. And we've talked about rituals of grief, rituals of passing, getting to critical mass in unleashing connecting connectives and creating this kind of ecological effect. I think this is where we get hope. We need hope to power hope. Thank you all for giving us a start to this day with a bit more of a sense of that.
Thank you.